This grandmother has a rapidly growing YouTube channel. Brenda Weltner has decoded the Book of Revelation so thoroughly that she's mapped out every important date with the exception of one, and they all land on God's appointed feast days. Don't believe it? Brenda shows her work in great detail on her YouTube channel and in her book, A Kingdom of Priests, The Stories of Revelation. It's available at Amazon on paperback, and the PDF version is free. I'm Brandon Conejo, and this is Faith Deep. Brenda, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. You're a very brave man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so who edits your videos? Who edits them? Yeah. That's me. Okay. And what program do you use? Um, I have a Mac, so it's iMovie. iMovie. Gotcha. I use Final Cut Pro. Okay. Um, what kind of camera do you use? It's just the one that's on my uh, computer. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, how did you come to the decision to start sharing your interpretations on YouTube? <laughs> well, um, uh, probably uh, back in 2015 or so, I started watching YouTube because I was interested in end times. Okay. And so I was watching everybody else do their you know, dog and pony show on end times. And uh, YouTube seemed to be like the platform where people were sharing information. And so when I started studying Revelation and started, you know, seeing things, I thought, well, you know, maybe I need to share on a platform that people are actually looking at. Um, so that's what I did. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And um, so what kind of jobs have you done in your life? <laughs> You know, I am probably the most unqualified person to be talking about uh, Revelation from the worldly standpoint because I'm a mom, okay? I uh, I raise kids. I don't have a college degree. I uh, We live on a small har hobby farm right now, and we have a cow that I milk. I have chickens, duck, dogs. I, I breed a dog, um, our little Rhodesian Ridgeback, and... Uh, I have a bunch of grandkids. So um, job-wise, uh, you know, my uh, ex-husband was a pastor, so I was a pastor's wife for, you know, 20 years. So I have some experience there, but, uh, yeah. Mother, full-time mother. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's Although great I to hear. I want to say this, that I, I have taught women's Bible studies. Mm -hmm. It's probably the... Um, probably the early 80s. So I've always liked teaching the Bible. I've always taught Bible studies. Um, you know, I've done it for years. And then I had kind of a space really from about 1999 up until maybe 2015 where I wasn't teaching at all. It was like God had this quiet space for me where I wasn't doing that anymore. And then he sort of launched me into this new deal with end time stuff. So <laughs> gotcha. God, the father gave us the book of revelation. This came out of his mind. It's his thoughts. And the spirit knows those thoughts of God. And he's able to reveal those thoughts of God to us when we look at the book. And when we humble ourselves and, and basically say, you know, I don't need to approach this book in an intellectual kind of way, even though this is my normal way of viewing the world. We are convinced of these things by the Spirit of God who lives inside of us. Can you give me the elevator pitch of your Revelation timeline? Yes, I can. I have it right here. Perfect. <laughs> so can I just read it to you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I, I could just spiel it, but I don't want to leave anything out, okay? This yeah. is my elevator pitch, okay? Totally. Revelation tells the story of the end time events that will take place during the last seven years prior to the visible return of Christ. Though the seven years are described in the book, okay, excuse me, I'm going to edit this, okay? Though seven years are described in the book, most of the events depicted actually take place during the first three and a half years. The story is told via symbols and imagery, and God's throne room in heaven is depicted as a heavenly temple. Various groups of believers, represented as priests, arrive in the heavenly temple according to their division to serve God and to worship God. 
the predetermined appointed times when each group will appear in heaven correlate with the various feasts of the Lord. And by utilizing the actual increments of time provided for us by God in the book of Revelation, the 1,260 days, three and a half days, five months, one hour, and so on, we're provided with enough information to know exactly when the events will take place. Revelation was given to us by the Father to encourage end time believers to hold fast in the face of persecution, trials, and even death, and to know that they are not and will not be forgotten. Their faithfulness will be rewarded and Jesus will come for them. There it is. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a temple story. That's what Revelation is. It's a temple story. Hmm. And so when have you... When, when is the first rapture going to take place? Well, that will happen on the Day of Atonement. Okay, that's when priests will go into the heavenly temple. But there is a feast day just before that. That's the Feast of Trumpets. And um, that takes place 10 days before the Day of Atonement. And it's on that feast day, which is on uh, the 18th. Um, it's a two-day feast, 18th and 19th of this month, September. That's the day that we will be glorified. Okay, and I, I think that the glorification of believers will take place before the rapture. So there you have it. And then when is the rapture? And then the rapture will be the 28th on the, on the Day of Atonement. So there's a 10-day uh, period of time between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. And the dead in Christ rise at the same time we're changed. So they're going to appear in heaven um, before we get there. Okay, but we will arrive 10 days later. So, okay. And just to be clear for the viewers, that is this month, September yeah. of 2020. Yes, that's just a few days away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like two <laughs> weeks <laughs> from this recording. Yeah. For some people, this is just foolishness and folly. And for other people, you know, there isn't enough proof for any of this. And that's, you know, kind of how it was planned. That's the design so that the faith walk has to be a part of it, that we can never arrive at this stuff in a worldly, basically satanic kind of way with duality. It's the third one. It's the tree of life. Okay. The spirit of God. What was the moment like for you when you realized uh, the revelation dates precisely align with the feast days? What, what was my feeling? Yeah, when, when, when you crack the code, basically, and, and figured out that they all line up on feast day. Um, I was shocked, actually. Um, I, I had done some preliminary stuff on this early in 2017, um, like in February of that year. And what I had done was I realized that, that we're talking about feast days here and that the, um, there was going to be a 2,550-day period between um, – the Feast of Trumpets, and the Day of Atonement. And the way the Jewish calendar is laid out, um, the feast days move, okay? So to get a 2,550-day increment period of time between Feast of Trumpets and Day of Atonement hardly ever happens. In fact, I went through um, 38 seven-year increments to find the one that actually worked and that's from 2017 to 2024 and when i had that experience of seeing this and having done the research and doing all the day counts and stuff like that for the 25 50 days which is 1290 days plus 1260 days okay that's where i get that number um i knew that the seven year period was between 2017 and 2024 so uh, even though the Revelation 12 sign came and went and we're still here after 2017, I didn't give up on that seven year time period because it's the only one that works. So then after nothing happened in 2017 in terms of a rapture, I knew that that time frame was correct and I just needed to figure out where I was wrong. Okay, <laughs> And then as different feast days started, correlating and lining up with the day counts in Revelation. And uh, and this is a three-year study, okay? So this is over a you know period of time of three years. As every day count was falling into place, I'm just like, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. <laughs> I can't believe what I'm seeing. This is, this is amazing. I, 
really, I was incredulous because I didn't go looking for it. I didn't try to make all this stuff fit. It, it just was, it just was fitting. So that's amazing. Yeah, incredulous. Wow. That's great. Yeah. And um, so what kind of comments do you get on your videos? Your videos are full of you explaining this decoding process and explaining what's happening. So what kind of comments do you get? Okay. I get anything from, you know, wow, I can't believe what you're saying. It so resonates with me. I just love what you're doing to, oh, you're a false prophet, a heretic. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be uh, telling people, you know, days. Uh, no one knows the day or the hour. Um, and I see myself kind of as a, uh, I guess, as a teacher. And so I like to use the comment section as an opportunity to kind of expand on what I talk on in the videos. So I, I like the comments. I, I'm challenged by them. A lot of times I'll take a comment and then it'll just raise a question for me. And really, it's because of the people who watch my videos that I was able to actually ask the right kinds of questions that help me discover a lot of this. So I, I love the comments and even commenters who are not so nice. They're great too. <laughs> right. They help your algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my son told me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you mentioned uh, Matthew 24. Um, I'm sure you often hear Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. And that's Jesus speaking. And so your interpretations are very controversial, highly because of that, I, I believe. Right. So what kind of opposition to your teachings have you encountered? Um, with regard to that verse there, um, a lot well, of... Well, in general, but I, I just, okay. sorry, yeah. wanted to prim primer it with that. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, a lot of people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and, and in, in my experience, they're the ones that have the most, you know, interest in this, okay? If you're post-trib, you tend to not be so interested in end time stuff, but pre-trib people, very interested. And so, uh, but the teaching that's come out of that particular brand of eschatology is not exactly biblical, and that's a huge problem. One of the, um, understandings that people have with a pre-trib rapture is that uh, we're the bride of Christ, that we're going to be taken as a bride into heaven for a seven-year marriage supper of the Lamb, and actually none of that's in the Bible. So that is a huge red flag for me, but it doesn't seem to be a problem for other people, <laughs> okay? The other is the idea that um, of this word tribulation, a seven year tribulation. And for many people, uh, I'll challenge them and I'll say, what do you mean when you use the word tribulation? And a lot of people will go, well, you know, and I go, no, I don't know. Because uh, the word tribulation in the Bible just means persecution, suffering and distress. But when uh, pre-trib people use it, they use it in the sense of tribulation equals the wrath of God. If tribulation equals the wrath of God, of course, we can't be here for that. And that's why we have to go in a pre-trib rapture. But uh, that terminology, tribulation, seven years of tribulation is nowhere to be found in scripture. There is no place that says there's seven years of wrath. Okay. And this was one of the first things I looked at was, is the seven year period a seven year time period of wrath? And I just, that's the one thing I thought, you know, I've got to research that. I've got to find out about that. So I, I actually researched this until I got to uh, the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. Okay. He's now passed away, Dr. Uh, Wal Walrude, uh, Walvard, or however you say his name, can't pronounce it exactly right. But they are the bastion of pre tribulation eschatology. And he said, there is no scripture that, uh, that says that there is a seven year time period of wrath. You can't find it. So if there isn't seven years of wrath, what that means then is that believers can actually be present in the seven years. And that sort of blows people's mind too. Uh, the idea that we can actually be in the tribulation and, you know, not have all kinds of seals and trumpets and bowls happening. So. Gotcha. Awesome. <laughs> Is this so, what you want to hear? <laughs> what's that? 
Is this the kind of stuff you're wanting to hear? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so in Matthew 24, 20, when talking about the end times, Jesus says, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. And that sounds to me like it could mean pray for a September 28th ascension, a Monday <laughs> in the fall or spring if you live in the southern half of the world. And it also happens to be Yom Kippur. And the very next thing Jesus says in the book of Matthew is, for then shall be great tribulation. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so the passage in in uh, Matthew 24, starting with verse 20, okay? Actually, when you start with verse 15, it talks about when you see the, the abomination of desolation or the desolating sacrilege, well, however your Bible says it, <clears throat> then you're supposed to flee into the wilderness. And so the idea here is we, we really need to know who the audience is here. Who is he talking to? He's talking to people who are actually going to see this event take place. And this is something that's going to take place at the midpoint of the seven years. And people in Israel are going to see it. People in Jerusalem, Judea, are going to see this event. When they see it, they are supposed to flee. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that the midpoint is actually, according to my timeline, what I've come up with, what I see in the word, is April 3rd of uh, 2021. Spring starts on March 20th, okay? So when they are going to have to flee, it will be spring. And not only that, the Sabbath, uh, the day of the abomination is the end of the Sabbath at 7 p.m. on that night they can start going, they can start fleeing into the wilderness. So um, they're gonna be going into the wilderness. God said he's gonna take care of them there. So this does not actually apply to us at all. Um, mm. so, so we don't need to worry about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I actually have a whole series um, on Matthew 24 where I, where I go through the whole book. Um, the part that is about us is from uh, verse looks like verse five um, through verse 14. And that's that's the part that's about believers. And then from uh, 15 on is for the Jews. So. OK. OK. <laughs> Can you tell me what a typical day is like in the life of Brenda Wilner? <laughs> oh, my goodness. OK, well, I'm usually up around 530 in the morning and uh, the last few months, uh, there's a couple of things I do. That's when I usually have my quiet time. That's usually when I would, would write for my in my book that I did. That's when I did my writing and praying and thinking. And um, uh, now I actually, that's when I uh, look at comments and answer emails and stuff. And then I, I milk my cow between 7.30 and 8. <laughs> I feed the chickens after that, water my greenhouses and gardens, take care of my dog. <laughs> do all that till probably about 9.30 or 10. And then I'm, I'll am i usually uh, get a script going to make a video. I'll usually shoot the video like after lunch, try and edit it in between uh, canning and uh, checking everything else around here. Um, yeah, and then it's back to looking at comments and stuff after dinner and then go to bed. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So now we're getting to the fun stuff. Okay. Can you describe a glorified human body? Oh, yes. It's a body just like Jesus' body. Okay. A glorified human body is uh is is a gosh, it's it's the thing we're really wanting, okay? It's a body that's going to be free of sin. So all of the pull that our natural flesh uh, are you know, who we are um in our DNA that inclines us towards sin, all that's going to be gone. There's going to be no more inclination to sin. So that that by itself is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's indestructible. You cannot destroy a glorified body. Okay, it has no sickness. No, the effects of aging are gone. Uh, um, any kind of you know disability, mental problems, everything is gone. You have a body that is perfect, okay? 
but it's more than perfect. Okay. It's more than perfect in that this body will actually um, be able to access heaven. Now, every single person is going to be raised from the dead at one point in time or another. Either you're going to be raised um, as a believer in a glorified state or after the millennium, there is another resurrection that's at the what's called the great white throne judgment. And at that resurrection, all the rest of the dead are going to be raised. They are just going to go back into kind of a ordinary kind of body, a regular body that uh, lives on the earth. They're going to live on the new earth. But a glorified body has access to heaven. We have access to the throne room of God, okay? And we can live on the earth. So it's a body that actually can interface two dimensions. So it's a body that can eat just like Jesus could eat. He could eat, he ate the fish, he could be touched and, you know, the disciples could touch him, but he could transport from one place to another. He could go to heaven and come back. Um, yeah, that's, it, it's amazing. So time and space are not going to be the problems that they are now. Like you can just go somewhere <laughs> just in your thoughts. And by the way, um, Philip in the book of Acts uh, was with the Ethiopian eunuch and uh, witnessing to him, baptized him. And then it said all of a sudden he showed up miles and miles away. I think it was in Samaria preaching to people there. So, this ability, um, you know, to kind of transport from one place to another isn't just uh, relegated to um, glorified bodies, but a glorified body can go to heaven and be in God's presence. A regular human body cannot do that. Even, even a resurrected human body can't do that. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not doing glorified bodies, trust me. Okay. When when exactly do you think we'll receive our glorified bodies like sundown sunrise i don't have any idea and to me that part isn't the um, most important part uh, i think we're going to hear something okay uh, revelation 10 is the place in revelation where we read about the glorification of believers the resurrection uh, from to immortality for the dead and the you know the change for us and it says that uh, Christ will roar like a lion and then there'll be the seven thunders okay that sound from heaven and I think there's we're gonna hear it people are gonna hear it and you will know people will know and you know my thinking is that this will be done sooner rather than later I think Christ wants us to be glorified at the earliest possible moment. So whenever that is, I think that's when it'll happen. Gotcha. And um, do you think you said uh, the ability to teleport and access mm -hmm. heaven is, is, uh, is, is in store for a glorified body. Do you think in the physical form, we will have anything like rapid healing or like athleticism or extraordinary strength? Okay. Um, I think we will have the ability to do whatever needs to be done. Okay. Whatever that is. Um, it's, you know, it's going to be in some ways a kind of a supernatural body. Well, it does. It exceeds the natural. So yes, it's a supernatural body. Um, I don't think we have the, the capacity to be wounded or to be sick. I, I don't think that is even a possibility with a glorified body. I don't think anybody can do that to it. Um, so that part is not a problem. And as far as, you know, having supernatural strength, I think whatever we need to do, we'll be able to do it. So uh, none of that's a problem. Gotcha. Okay. And um, will a glorified body need sleep or food? I don't think so. No. I, yeah. you, you can eat certainly, yeah. but I don't think you'll, I don't think you'll need to sleep. I, nah. Okay. And what about children? Will they receive glorified bodies? And if so, will they become adults? Okay. That's a really good question that the Bible doesn't really address specifically. Okay. We know uh, from what the Bible does say that anyone who's been born again of the spirit of God, who has the spirit living inside of them, will receive a glorified body, okay? That's our guarantee of glorification, right? 
and glorification is just one aspect of salvation, which is a free gift, um, you know, by grace through faith. So if a child has received Christ and been born again, I don't care how old they are, you know, I hear of three-year-olds who have been born again, they too will receive a glorified body. But I think that it will just be a, you know, kind of a junior version. I don't think they will automatically appear as an adult. Um, but I, I don't really know that for sure. The Bible doesn't really say. Um, as far as children in general, I tend to think that when Paul was talking about how the children of believing parents are sanctified, that is, they're set apart, they, they're they protected, they're, you know, God views them um, in a different way than children of people who aren't saved, that those children are going to be preserved in whatever way. I don't know that they're necessarily glorified, but they are protected. I think we have that guarantee. And then as far as like the rest of the children in the world, okay, I don't know. I, all I know is that God is good, that God is good. He's merciful. He's just. He only ever does what is right. And when we look back on what he's done, we always go, wow, I would have never thought of that. You know, God, you do all things well. So that's my that's my understanding of okay. the children. Okay. Let me go just a little bit deeper with that question. And uh, you may not know the answer, but it's okay. kind of a playful question. What if there's a, a pregnant believer? What happens? Does she get a glorified body? And what happens to the unborn child? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times people have asked me that. <laughs> and I actually have, um, you know, I have a niece who's pregnant right now and she'll be, you know, pregnant up until November. I have no idea. But uh, they, I believe that person will be glorified, the adult person who's pregnant. And the, I believe the baby will be you know, protected and all of that. I don't know that the baby is necessarily glorified, but the baby is, you know, enveloped in this uh, person who is. So I think all is well. And, you know, maybe they deliver in heaven. Maybe the baby is, you know, um, supernaturally C-sectioned. I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. Um, it is interesting to think about, though. I, I, I can't wait to get on the other side and see what God did. <laughs> <laughs> so what about um, pregnancy? Do you think uh, it, it would be possible to create more people in, in a glorified state? Um, no, I don't think that's the role of glorified people. And by the way, there is a finite number of glorified people. Okay. Mm. Um, once we get to the end of the seven years and the, uh, martyrs of the beast, who are that last group who are awaiting resurrection when they um, are resurrected at the second coming of Christ, that is, that's the end, okay? After that, there are no more glorified people. Glorified people go to live in a special place that Christ is preparing for them. That's the new Jerusalem in heaven. It's a, uh, it's a place that's, finite in a certain way that there's only so many people who can live in the new Jerusalem. Now, when it comes to the new earth though, and people are resurrected, will they have children? Well, I, you know, that part, I don't know. Um, glorified people won't. Um, other resurrected people, I don't know. It's possible. I don't know. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, do you think we'll gain knowledge in our glorified state? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If we can access heaven, it, it would make sense that we would gain knowledge just from that right. experience alone. Yes. And, you know, the Bible tells us that God has, has given us the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit. And that part of our sanctification process is the renewal of our mind. Okay. That, um, you know, getting our thoughts so that we think along spiritual lines the way God thinks and in, in his, his realm of thinking. And once we're not confined to this body and this earthly way of thinking and we think God's thoughts, I think we have really have access to the mind of God. The, the spirit of God will give us all the knowledge and information we need at the time we need it. It's, you know, this wonderful flow of truth and reality. 
I think it'll be amazing. I, I, I think it'll be totally stress-free. I don't think we have to learn anything. It will just be there for us. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you believe? Oh, sorry, I skipped one. Uh, so what will you do with your 10 days of having a glorified body on this earth before the rapture? What will you do with your okay. 10 days? All right. Well, I, I may go ahead and spill the beans on your your interview here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I, I, you know, all of this is a process of discovery. All this revelation stuff, really, it's been a process of discovery and learning. And I learn something new all the time in the book. I Honestly, I, I'm learning something all the time. So one of the words that's used in Revelation um, that I get a lot of heat for is when I call, um, when, the, when Revelation talks about the mighty angel or the glorious angel, uh, and it's referring to Christ as the angel of the Lord. Okay, he's the messenger of God. He's not an angel. Okay, he's the eternal son, but he's acting as a messenger. And that word angel can be translated as messenger. It's just simply the word messenger. And uh, we think of angels as messengers. So, you know, but in the Bible, uh, that same word that we translate as angel often is translated as a messenger for a human messenger, just a regular person who's delivering a message. Okay, so I, I'm thinking about this. I'm getting to the answer to your question, okay? Um, so I'm thinking about this, and my husband and I are talking about the 10 days, and I said, you know, I really hope that I get to talk to one of the 144,000. I, I hope that's what I get to do. I really want to do that. And he said, oh, yeah, you, you'll get to talk to one of those people, I'm sure. And then I, I started thinking about that. And I'm like, well, how does he, why is he so sure about that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then as I'm thinking about this, all of a sudden I remember that the letters to the seven churches, okay, they're not church history. They are actually letters that are written to the 144,000 to help them stay true to God, okay, to help them not defile themselves with the women of Revelation who are the harlot and her daughters, okay, it's all metaphorical, symbolic, and Jesus holds seven stars in his hand in Revelation chapter one, and he tells John that these are the angels of the seven churches, these are the messengers that go to the seven churches, okay, basically what he's saying is these are the, the entities who will share the message that's in these letters with the 144,000. So then I went, oh, well, maybe the angels that he's talking about are people who are bringing a message to the 144,000 who will need to know what is the deal, okay? They're going to need to know the timeline. They're gonna to need to know that they've got a rapture coming, when to expect to be um, filled with the Holy Spirit, all the things that are coming and the time frame that these things are happening in and how will that get communicated to them? And really, I don't know of any other way except through people. So yeah, maybe that's what I'll get to do. I'm sort of hoping. Yes. That mm. sounds really strange though. I know. <laughs> no, it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what do you believe at this point, uh, what do you believe uh, the body of Christ ought to be doing in these last days? Okay. Well, number one, people really need to be seeking the Lord. Really, they they need to be going to the Lord in prayer. They need to be looking at the Word, um, really being sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And if they have opportunity as God opens doors to share the gospel with people, to get people saved uh, before the 18th, okay, get them, you know, pray with them, talk to them about, you know, the necessity of being born again. That to me is, is hugely important. Um, you know, I think just spending time in praise and worship, that's what we're going to be doing in heaven. And I think God speaks to us in our praise and our worship and our prayer time and as we're in the word. And then he can guide us and instruct us as to what he wants us to do. Because ultimately, we're his servants. 
okay? We serve him. And, you know, we need to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm available to you today. And really, that's what I say. Every morning when I wake up, I'm laying in my bed. I wake up and I go, Lord, I'm your servant. What do you want me to do today? I'll do whatever you want to do. Interrupt my life. You know, change my plans. I just want to serve you. And, and I don't even really need to be right. I just want to be faithful to what I think you want me to do. So, yeah, it's, you know, praying for the lost, speaking to people. Um, uh, I think for some people, they may want to put up a, some supplies, you know, food and stuff like that. But, um, but you don't have to do that. Okay. That's just as the Lord leads. So. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here comes one of those challenging questions. Okay. In the spirit of the show, I, oh. uh, I'd like to do deep questions. Okay. So 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14 says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, mm -hmm. but I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over the man, but okay. to be in silence. For Adam was for first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So what are your thoughts on that? Okay. Well, okay. Number one, YouTube is not church. Okay. <laughs> so, um, this is not a church presentation. Um, that passage, you know, I, it's funny. Someone just sent me an email today. What, what are you doing preaching? And I'm like, I, I'm not really preaching. <laughs> I'm sharing what God has given me in my devotional life. Okay. That's all I'm doing. Okay. I'm sharing. And in the body of Christ, we build each other up, okay? We encourage one another. We share with one another. We share what God is doing in our life. And so I suppose if you're looking at me as teaching and preaching, well, you may have a problem, but I'm sharing my Christian life with you. And so you can do with it whatever you want, okay? I, I, We have a home fellowship that meets at our home, okay? And we don't actually have any paid pastor or preacher or teacher and Everybody gets to share, okay, because God has given a gift to everybody for the edification of the whole body, okay? So, um, you know, we don't believe in any kind of head honcho person. We believe that the Spirit will speak through everybody, okay? And then it's on everybody to discern what was just said. So, um, you know, I, I just share because the Spirit of God has been placed inside of me. He's given me something to say. And early on, I sort of weighed this out. And I said, uh, you know, Lord, I got stuff to share. And before, I used to just do women's Bible studies. Okay, I taught women. I didn't teach um, men. I, I didn't do any of that. Okay, but on YouTube, we're just talking. This is sharing. Anybody can share. Okay, this is not a church setting. So I started thinking about this. Okay. I can share what I'm learning and put myself out there, or I can keep this all to myself. And, and then I thought, yes, and you'd be a coward. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, God is asking us to live bravely. And, you know, you only have one life on this side. You only get one chance to live courageously. And so I thought, you know, my fears and my apprehensions and my feelings that I'm not qualified or my feelings that I'm going to be misunderstood, misinterpreted, uh, wrong motives attached to me. I thought, yeah, I could I could spare myself all of that. I said, but I'd be a coward. OK, and I know I only have one life and I'm going to live it with as much enthusiasm and boldness and bravery as I can so that I'm not appearing before Christ as a coward. So there you have my answer. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. And so you mentioned uh, the worship you participate in mm -hmm. uh, that happens at your house. Do you go to a, a church on Sundays? No, uh, we uh, sort of opted out of uh, institutional church. Actually, my husband and I sort of opted out of that like years and years ago doesn't mean that we don't go and visit or might not even like, um, you know, attend a church for, you know, a certain period of time. But um, the way the institutional church is set up is in a hierarchical way. 
And so you get this kind of pyramidal structure, uh, top-down hierarchy, and you've got the people at the top who, um, you know, the pastors or the, you know, denominational headquarters or whatever. And then they are the people who are to discern whatever's true and then the down to the little sheeple down on the bottom. And, you know, I don't think that that's originally the way church was supposed to happen. I think we were meant to, everybody has something, everybody, not just a pastor and not just a worship leader, but every single person has a gift of the spirit that is for the edification and upbuilding of the body of Christ. And if you are, have a group of, you know, even more than 50 people, how is everybody going to be able to contribute? It can't happen. It doesn't happen. So people have become spectator Christians. They're not engaged in the worship of God. And that is a huge problem in today's Christianity, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, yeah, we don't do uh, big church anymore. We don't do that. Thank you. I, I love that answer. And I, I got to say, I largely agree with you, if not 100 percent agree with you. OK. Well, you know what? A home fellowship, I'll tell you, there's something new every week. It, and you always feel like the spirit is is guiding and directing and you can't you know you're not relying on a you know a bulletin with a program and you know we do this 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 mm -hmm. and that. it's a like ceremony yes and so sometimes you know we'll meet for eight hours we always have a meal we'll you know be in prayer and worship and the word and fellowship and share our needs and stuff. I mean it's amazing really it's it's so exciting and to me, it's much more uh, fun to be a Christian in, in that setting than it is to go to church for an hour. Gotcha. Wow, that, that yeah, that sounds really cool. Maybe you should do a video that <laughs> out, outlines how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just in the New Testament. <laughs> oh, okay. So now it is time for the portion of our show called Letters to the Church. This is a letter by me to the church, okay. and I could be wrong, but hear me out. So the following is a letter by myself, and in the future, I would like viewers to submit their letters to the church so that I can do what I'm doing with my guests today mm -hmm. and um, read the, the, the letter not only to them, but to all of the viewers and, you know, hopefully the whole world. <laughs> so this is my opinion. This is not the opinion of you, Besutter Now or Conejo Brothers Media. So, to the Church of Jesus Christ, think about the stars for a moment. How many constellations do you know? Who taught you those constellations? Who taught them? How long have we seen those same constellations? Thousands of years? Forever and ever? If Earth is spinning and flying through space at millions of miles per hour and the universe is ever expanding, then why do those same constellations look so still every night? <laughs> if outer space is a vacuum, how does Earth hold an atmosphere and water? <laughs> why do you believe Earth is a globe? Have you seen it with your own eyes? Have you been to outer space? No. The truth is you accept the globe on faith. Mm -hmm. People have told you it's a ball. TV has told you it's a ball. Mm -hmm. Science has told you it's a ball. Mm -hmm. But what does the word of God say? The reality is that you believe earth is a globe because the one world religion prophesied in the book of Revelation has gained control of your mind through deception. Science accepted as doctrine has become the one world faith. It's not a stretch to say most people believe science over the word of God. Science, capital S, <clears throat> proved that fact, fact in March of 2020. Where in the Bible does it say there are billions of other planets, suns, and moons? Where does the Bible say that Earth is spinning and flying through outer space? The answer is that the Bible doesn't say any of those things. The Bible says that the earth does not move. It says that the sun and moon are above us and that earth 
I mean, sorry, and that heaven is above all of that. Which way is up on the globe? The book of Revelation describes the one world religion as the great harlot. Mm -hmm. A religion can be described as a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. Dictionary.com. A harlot is a prostitute subject to money. Is science subject to money? Ask Bill Gates. Science says that nothing exploded and created everything. They call that the Big Bang Theory. Science says that the universe contains billions of planets. Science says that we evolved from single-celled organisms. Science says that Earth is a meaningless spinning ball. All of these are lies that contradict page one of the Bible. If you believe any of those lies, science has deceived you. When speaking about the end times, the very first thing Jesus said was, Take heed that no man deceive you. Matthew 24, 4. Mm -hmm. It's becoming more and more apparent why he said that. These lies of science are building and building upon each other and leading many down the path of destruction. Science is the one world religion. It has taken control of mm -hmm. the world and the coronavirus pandemic has proven this. Scientists said that we must shut down everything, including churches, because of an invisible danger that is infecting people. And what happened? All nations and tongues believed the high priests of science and shut down everything, including the majority of churches, without seeing any real proof. Mm -hmm. The world put its faith in science and obeyed. At a time when the spirit of fear gripped the people of the world, science said shut down the churches, that order was obeyed, and the people were left without a place to gather and worship the Lord. The church should be ashamed. Science and the kings of the earth are now drunk with power, and we see it all over the news in the form of ridiculous safety measures. Prophecy has been fulfilled right in front of us. Now consider the mark of the beast prophesied in the book of Revelation. It would certainly appear that science is leading us to take a vaccine in conjunction with a digital ID that will soon be mandatory in order to sell, buy, board a plane, or be near others. Do some research on that, viewers. Countless men and women have died to preserve and spread the word of God. They have endured and continue to endure torture, persecution, and murder. The Bible says that his word would be preserved to the end. Why? So that science could prove it wrong? So that the believers in the end would place their faith in science and shut down all the houses of worship? Romans 3, 4 says, let God be true, but every man a liar. What does that mean to a believer? It means that even if every man on earth is saying one thing and they all believe it, you should be prepared to go against all of the deceived and believe the word of God over them. It also suggests that there will be at least one topic that every person has wrong. That topic was the shape of the earth. I say was because there are now thousands, if not millions of believers that now know that earth is the way that the Bible describes it. It is the center of all creation, mostly flat, stationary, and with a molten glass dome covering it, separating the waters below from the waters above. There are well over 200 verses in the Bible that disprove the heliocentric model. Page one of the Bible reads, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Genesis 1, 7 through 8. I'm getting close to the end, I, I promise. Job 38, 17 says, Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? First Chronicles 16, 30 says, The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 40, 22 says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants, th inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spread them out as a tent to dwell in. The Bible says over and over that the earth has a face. A face is a geometrical flat surface. A clock has a face. Spheres do not have a face. Mm -hmm. Numbers 12.3 says, 
Now the man Moses was very meek above, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Luke 21, 35 says, for as a snare shall it come on them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Do you believe the story of tower, excuse me, <clears throat> do you believe the story of the tower of Babel? Men tried to build a tower so tall and great that it, that it would reach heaven. And what did God do? He stopped them. Why? Because he didn't want those fools to reach outer space and kill themselves? No, it's because if God did not intervene with a miracle and confused all of their language, they would have succeeded in reaching the firmament of heaven. Now apply that story. Now apply what that story teaches us to NASA and space travel. Mm -hmm. The Lord stopped the Tower of Babel from reaching up to heaven, but allows rockets. In the book of John chapter 3, Jesus says, If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Mm -hmm. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So do you believe scientists have built rockets that reach the heavens? The truth is that outer space is science fiction and NASA is no different than Disney. Nazi scientists and one Nazi scientist and one of the original heads of NASA, Werner von Braun, was actually friends with Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. It's all make believe, and the truth is out there. Mm -hmm. YouTube used to be plentiful with videos that exposed NASA's trickery. Mm -hmm. They're much harder to find now. Werner von Braun has Psalms 19:1 on his headstone: "The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork." Mm -hmm. If that's not a deathbed confession, then I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. If you believe Earth is a spinning ball, is a ball spinning through outer space, you don't believe there's an up and a down. You believe there's an in and an out, outer space mm -hmm. and the inner core of Earth. Apply that to heaven and hell, and what do you get? Heaven is out of reach, and hell is within. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like a message from God or from Satan? <laughs> The Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies and deception is his greatest weapon. Mm -hmm. What should that mean to a believer? It means that the, de the devil is capable of deceiving any and every man, including you. That's exactly what he has done. Mm -hmm. The Bible warns us that even the elect can be deceived. Mm -hmm. Wake up and believe the word of God. The deceptions of science are becoming greater. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that, Brenda? Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a very big, long essay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> touched on a whole bunch of things there, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've looked into and I've researched a lot of that. And I, in my book, okay, which I have a copy of here. There it is. In Kingdom of Priests. There went my dog. Um, one of the first things I talk about is the harlot. Okay. Is the harlot, which is, it's, it's called, he's, the harlot is called Mystery Babylon, meaning we've, we've got to go all the way back to uh, Babel, Babylon. It's the same place. Going back to the Tower of Babel. What was going on there, you know, with Nimrod, who is a type of the Antichrist, who is, you know, building this empire, uh, who is against God. And what happened there, actually, was the beginning of the Mysterion, okay, which is the mystery part of Babylon. And that word Mysterion is the Greek word for mystery. And what it means is this. Don't talk, don't tell. Okay, we have secrets, we're going to keep our secrets, and the, the truth will be hidden in the top of the pyramid, and we're going to uh, dispense lies on the way down. So that by the time you get to the bottom of the, the tower or the pyramid or whatever you want to call it, all people know are pretty much lies. And I use the example of The Matrix, okay, the movie The Matrix. And in the Matrix, uh, I, don't know, I forget the name of the guy now. It's my dog out there. Wanting Neo. To... Uh, no, it's the the Morpheus. Morpheus, yes. <laughs> Morpheus is telling Neo that everything, 
everything has been infiltrated, okay, by the matrix. It's everything. It's in your churches. It's in your, you know, medicine. It's everywhere, okay? And that's the truth, okay? They tell you the truth in these movies. They will not tell you the truth in school, okay? But they're going to tell you the truth in the movies, all right? Because they, I think they have to. I think that's a cosmic rule of the game. They have to tell you the truth somewhere. But people are told the truth in movies like The Matrix, for example, um, and but they dismiss it because that's entertainment. That can't possibly be true. But the fact is, is that uh, this mysterion, this um, where the truth is at the top and it's hidden and we don't let people know what the truth is. Because if people know the truth, you can't control them. So you control people through lies and through the illusion of truth and through institutions, okay? Every single institution is part of mystery religion of Babylon. Okay, and I want to give you one example of when all of a sudden this became real to me. OK, so uh, one of my uh, stepdaughters was graduating from from university. And we went to the commencement exercise. OK, and we're sitting in the back of this huge auditorium. And when the, the ceremony starts, there uh, there's a color guard, of course, walking in the military and there's songs and everybody goes up front where there's this stage, which is kind of like an altar looking affair and of course the lights are down in the um in the you know audience and the lights are up and you've got all these people in their robes and wearing all this fancy stuff and their mortar boards on their head and they all have degrees and they're um giving degrees to people and i went oh my gosh i am sitting here in a religious ceremony that is all about the harlot. It was like, I can't believe that here I am. And this is this goes on from the time little kids, you know, graduate from kindergarten and get their little mortar board on their head and go through the ceremony. And I'm like, you know, this is has so infiltrated every single part of our life. You can hardly um get it out of your mind. It's little tentacles are everywhere in our mind. So, uh, yeah, every, every, really everything you know is wrong, pretty much. If you learned it in school or you learned it, you know, in the world, it, it's wrong. God's word is true. These things are not true. And, you know, we've been sold a bill of goods. Really, we have. Yeah. There's no defending it. <laughs> so I have to ask you plainly then, do you yeah. believe the earth is flat and stationary. Well, I think that's what the Bible would suggest. And I don't think NASA went into space. Thank you. Yeah, I agree very much, as you can tell by my yeah. letter. <laughs> that's yeah. excellent. Thank you. Welcome. There's a lot of talk among truthers about an upcoming asteroid attack on the United States and possibly more of the world. Um, an alleged FEMA whistleblower recently put out a video making that claim, and Pastor Dana Coverstone has shared a dream that featured a rock landing in a puddle and creating massive waves. Um, also, a fist pulverized the month of November in one of his dreams. Nice. Um, what are your thoughts on a possible asteroid attack on Earth? Okay, so um, there's a couple of ways that this can happen. There, there can actually be rocks that come in i you know i don't dismiss the whole idea of meteors and all of that just because outer space may not be what we think it is i think it's very possible that those things can be coming in the other thing is that this stuff you know we're getting into the kind of realm of conspiracy theory stuff but you know i don't put anything past these people i really don't they're they're you know they get information from the dark side they learn this stuff from demonic entities. This is not, the information that we have is not something we would come up with by ourselves. And I think there is, you know, I wouldn't doubt but what there's space wars, okay? That we already are up there. It's very possible that, that whatever looks like it's asteroids or meteors could, could be natural, but it could also be as a result of what 
people are doing up there or people and entities are doing up there. So, and then as far as the fist going through the month of November, okay, if you've looked at my timeline, the pit is opened on October 31st. Okay, that's the second full moon of the month. It's a blue moon. It's on a Saturday. It also happens to be uh, right when uh, daylight savings time ends. So you get this kind of extra hour, you know, added on to November 1st anyway, but in the middle of that night. And that is when the pit is going to be opened and if all really all hell is going to break loose. So the fact that he saw the fist going through November is really, I think it's about the pit being opened and this locust army coming forward and doing bad things to people. So, yeah. And as far as the asteroids, and there, there is going to be something, okay? So Revelation 12 tells us that in, in symbolic form, that before the child is caught up to God into his throne, that Satan or the dragon is going to cast a third of his stars to the earth. And I think this can show up in a couple of ways and revelation is layered. Okay. So it could actually be something that looks like stars coming to the earth, whether they're asteroids, bombs, I don't know, something that looks like stars falling, but in revelation stars are also angels and Satan has fallen angels. And I think that he's going to disguise his fallen angels as um, aliens. So there's going to be some kind of really nasty thing coming from the sky <laughs> right around the time that we are changed and raptured. It's going to be adding to this confusion that's happening at the same time. Yeah. And in my opinion, um, aliens appearing would be the perfect cover for yeah. millions of people being raptured and yeah. just disappearing from yeah. Earth. Yep. It's a cover story. And they've been working that one for a really long time. You know, what's really interesting to me is that you go back in these archaeological whatevers in ancient Egypt and you see these carvings of like helicopters. Have you seen this? And carvings of what looks like, you know, airplanes and stuff. And people go, how did they know about that stuff? Well, they were going to tell people how to do that later on. So, yeah, it's all connected. The, <laughs> the enemy's plan is is 6,000 years old at least, okay? And they've been working us for 6,000 years. Yeah. And see, that's one of the reasons why I think um, debunking the globe in outer space is so important is because mm -hmm. um, you're not going to believe aliens from another planet are showing up if you know that there aren't other planets and that Earth is all there is. And yeah. Yeah. Um, Can you tell me what wormwood is? Wormwood uh, is, is whatever it is. I can tell you what what it does. Okay, wormwood turns the fresh waters bitter so that they're undrinkable. It's something that comes into our atmosphere, whether and, and it must explode or something and cast uh, you know debris or ash or gases or something over the fresh water to make the fresh water so it's not drinkable anymore. So. You know, I don't think it's a nuclear thing, though. It, maybe it could be. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I only know what it does. Okay. Fair enough. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Brenda Weltner's book is A Kingdom of Priests, and it is available for free right now, courtesy of Brenda, um, <laughs> on in paperback, and uh, the free PDF is on Amazon. So okay. go to her YouTube channel and start binge watching and scroll down to the video descriptions where Brenda always leaves important links like where to find those books. Mm -hmm. And um, also leave, sorry, um, I, I wrote that really weird. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I have to say that I, I recently started watching your channel and uh, you have made me a believer that the rapture <laughs> is going to happen this month and um, that your timeline is accurate. Um, so all the viewers, please go get a copy of Brenda's book because if we are leaving, you want to leave behind something tangible and not something electronic that can just be, you know, taken out by an EMP or anything like that. Um, so Brenda, can you please explain your decision to offer the digital copy of your book for free? Well, if I could have offered the paperback for free, I would have, but Amazon won't let you do that, okay? I just think that this is information 
Um, the Bible says freely um, you've been given, you know, then you need to give it away. I mean, this isn't stuff that I came up with. This isn't really my stuff. Really, I believe this is stuff that the Lord gave me, and I'm not going to make any money off of it. I, I Why would I do that? Um, my goal is to advance the kingdom of God and advance uh, what he's wanting to do. I, you know, people have dissed me. They say, oh, you're just wanting to sell a book and make money. And yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not if so you're giving it away for free. I, mean, I think I make like a dollar on every paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That kind of shatters that argument. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and also, I just want to mention that it's been my book's been translated into three languages too. It's in Spanish and Portuguese and Dutch, and someone's working on the French right now and also Russian. So, and I think someone start tried to start the German uh, translation too. So they're working on all of those, and uh, yeah, so the they're available for free in the tra those translations as well. Excellent. Um, just a few more questions if you have the time. Sure. Okay. Um, have you made any changes in your life in response to the imminent first rapture? Um, I haven't done as much canning as I normally do. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't made, uh, I haven't made my gardens weed free. I, I there <laughs> things that I, I, I've had to make this decisions about my time. Okay. So where I would normally be out weeding and have a really nice garden, uh, mm -hmm. there's weeds everywhere and that's just the way it goes. Um, uh, changes in my life. I get up earlier so that I can, um, have time to do the stuff for, you know, my channel as well as do my regular work. But as far as like, uh, have I quit a job? No, I haven't quit my job because I don't have a job. Okay. <laughs> And uh, um, my husband's still going to work. We're all still doing our normal life. I never tell people, you know, quit your job, you know, give away all your money. You know, we're to occupy, which means every day we, we do what we did the day before. Okay. Until we can't do that anymore. Gotcha. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and how has your journey as a YouTuber been for you? Oh, boy. Well, you know, for the most part, it's really... Um, it's a positive experience. I'll say that part. It's very positive because it's really helped me to grow as a person to re reflect on, you know, when someone has an uh, issue with what I'm saying, I, contrary to what people think, I do evaluate it. I'll look at this and then I'll take it apart and go, is there any validity to what they're saying? I'll do some research or whatever. And so that part of the YouTube um, channel thing has been really beneficial for me, helping me to just fine tune and look at things deeper. Um, I, honestly, I am the introvert's introvert. You might not know that right here, but I require vast amounts of time all by myself. So, um, you know, uh, answering comments and stuff I, I i feel like i really want to because i have a heart for people but that really does wear me out it makes me really tired <laughs> but i you know i figured this is only going to be for a little while longer and it's the last part of that race that you you just want to give it your all and so um yeah but youtube's you know it's youtube yeah you know yeah definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah um do you have any favorite youtubers Not really. I, I subscribe to like over 300 channels. Okay. So I get all kinds of stuff that comes up. But as far as I, I don't really have a, a favorite YouTuber. No. Nah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no worries. <laughs> and so uh, last question is, do you have any advice for your brothers and sisters? Okay. Um, my main advice for people out there is really seek the Lord. If you, you know, if you know the Lord, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you and you need to bring everything to him. Uh, don't believe me just because I'm saying something. Okay. I, I am not the Holy Spirit for you. You have the Holy Spirit who can guide you into all truth. Open your Bible, pray, ask God to lead you. And 
really, and then do what he says. Whatever the Lord is leading you to do, do that and do it a hundred percent. Give give it all you've got. Don't, you know, a lot of people really want to hedge their bets, you know, and they don't want to get, you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm all in, you know, <laughs> the Lord leads you be all in. Then that's just, that's my, that's my approach to life. And so I just really encourage people to, to be all in with whatever it is that they, the Lord has led them to believe. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining me and being my very first guest. On well, you're, welcome. you're welcome. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. It was a pleasure. Okay. God bless. Thank you. <laughs>